Uh, my name is Danielle Edges. I am mom to Alexandra, age seven, who was born with heterotaxy. Um, I am also a co-coordinator for Heterotaxy Connection Southwest, which is a group, a nonprofit group, that helps support, educate, and empower uh, parents of newly diagnosed families of heterotaxy. So this is Alexandra. Want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> How old are you? And what grade are you in? I'm Chris and this is Carolyn. Carolyn is two and a half years old and was born with um, heterotaxy syndrome. Heterotaxy syndrome, the story of Alexandra and Carolyn. What is heterotaxy syndrome? So heterotaxy syndrome is basically a condition that is present at birth. Um, it can span um, all ranges of different specialties in, in, in the medical field, from cardio to um, cardiology to hepatology, nephrology, orthopedics, neurology. It really is a multi-specialty um, condition that affects the laterality of a person's body. Cytotaxy syndrome is a condition that um, starts with the heart being on the opposite side of the body and um, kind of goes from there. So there are a lot of different things that are associated with heterotaxy syndrome. Um, not all kids necessarily have them, but things like intestinal malnutrition, um, different things like that are all included in the scope of heterotaxy. How has heterotaxy syndrome affected your daughter's life? Um, it's affected her a lot of ways. It, um, she was born with um, a complex congenital heart defect. Her heart is on the opposite side. She um, has had two heart surgeries so far. She's had an abdominal surgery, which is associated to the heterotaxy. Another thing that um, we weren't sure about, and it, it doesn't affect Carolyn as much as it does some kids, but a lot of kids with heterotaxy have um, either no spleen or multiple spleens. And thankfully, Carolyn's is mostly intact, um, and it does seem to be functioning, and that's a really good thing. Um, we got really lucky with that because um, your spleen is, is sort of a backup to your, your immune system. Well, basically, the liver is midline, so usually your liver is kind of like over here. Um, usually, her, her stomach is on the right. Um, she has the hypoplastic pancreas. She has, which is really interesting, she has a trilobed lung and a bilobed lung. And she has two right lungs instead of a right and a left lung, um, which is kind of a really neat little, <laughs> you know, thing, because that's not typical. Um, but that it basically, that is what, in terms of her visceral organs, so the organs in the thoracic and the abdominal region of the body, um, they're pretty much affected there. And of course, with the malrotation of the intestines, but that's very, very typical with heterotaxy. Um, she also has a very rare liver condition called Abernathy malformation, which is congenital absence of the portal vein. Um, it is extraordinarily, extraordinarily rare. Um, and it, I can't even tell you, um, like, number-wise, uh, who is affected by Abernathy malformation because there's like three articles on it. <laughs> um, um, of a condition called hepatopulmonary syndrome, which is also something that Alexandra has um, in result of that. What has been done thus far to combat the complications from heterotaxy? She's had five heart surgeries uh, so far. She's had a BT shunt, which is typically what they do for somebody who is a single ventricle. They go through a three-stage process of heart surgeries. Um, the first surgery they call is the BT shunt. Um, and then she had another one that was five days old. She had that surgery. And um, then she had another one at six months old, which is called the Kawashima, which is a connection between um, the arteries um, going from the heart that actually deliver blood back to the lungs. Um, and then she... Um, then she had a, what we call a fontan, which is essentially a hepatic connection to the heart um, that gets all the blood flow from the bottom half of your body back into circulation again. Um, and then she had another surgery um, after that in 2011 that um, was a, another basically fontan connection uh, to help get more blood flow from the bottom because one of her lungs is being um, favored over another. The, um, the intestinal surgery was to re repair um, Part of her intestine was, was rotated the wrong way. Um, when, when kids are 
in utero when, when their um, intestinal, their digestive systems are developing. Um, the small intestine actually leaves the body, turns around, um, and then goes back in. And um, for some reason when hers left and rotated, it didn't rotate properly. And so when, um, when she was a couple weeks old, we realized that she wasn't able to, to handle food as well as she could. Um, so she was basically, everything that she would take in, she would throw back up. Um, so they found that there was almost a complete blockage because basically what had happened was instead of it being a tube, there was like a crimp in the tube. And um, so they repaired that. Um, her heart surgeries repaired um, repaired a, a large ASD, which is the atrial septal defect. It, um, her heart, instead of having four chambers when she was born, um, the septum separating the right atrium from the left wasn't there. And so she had that built in. She had a common valve, which was sort of like a peanut. Um, and so they went in and separated and made two separate valves. They um, also went in and installed a pacemaker. And um, she's going to need to have pacemaker surgeries her whole life. So um, she's not really done with that. She's done with it for now. But in another six months or so, she's going to need um, pacemaker surgery. She also had her appendix out for what it's worth. And I'm actually really glad that they did that um, because with her body, her organs aren't necessarily all in the right place to begin with. And so if she had ever had a problem with her appendix, it wouldn't necessarily be in the place that doctors expect, um, expect it to be. So that was a nice sort of preemptive thing that they did. She's had so many different therapies. She's had, um, you know, whole teams of specialists working with her. She's had developmental um, evaluations and developmental help because, um, you know, she was sort of delayed in some of the stuff that she did. She um, has worked with speech therapists. She's worked with. Um, just all sorts of different, different people, different care workers to, um, yeah. to sort of help her grow up normally. What is life currently like for your daughter? Right now, thankfully, it, it, it's not affecting too much. Um, you know, the biggest thing with her is that if she, if she were to get certain diseases, um, even if she had the flu really bad, it would kill her. So, um, you know, we just need to be really careful with taking her out and exposing her to things. A lot of, a lot of things that that normal kids would catch um, affect her, affect her worse. Um, just because she doesn't have the um, the full immunity and the, I guess, stamina to to take on some of those big diseases. And it seems like. Um, things are going really well right now, which is kind of scary because, um, you know, I'm just waiting for, for that downtime to happen because it's going to happen at some point. Um, so it's kind of scary. Her, her main risk at this point is her risk of stroke. She has um, these things in her lungs called pulmonary arteriovenous malformations, which are basically abnormal connections between the veins and the arteries. Um, and they, they're just these tiny little vessels, and the blood flows through so, so fast that there's actually never any exchange of oxygen or carbon dioxide. So all that just stays into uh, the bloodstream. And so her oxygen levels are much slower. Well, when you have oxygen levels that are much lower than that, your blood has a tendency, or your body has a tendency, really, to create more red blood cells. So your hematocrit goes up higher, makes your blood thicker. Okay. Of course, when you have really thick blood, what do you do? You get clots. What is a stroke? A stroke is basically caused by a clot. At this point, the only thing we can really do is manage her uh, pharmaceutically. Okay. Um, so making sure she's taking medicines like diuretics.
keep her blood pressure lower, keep the workload on the heart easier. Um, and then she takes all kinds of different um, GI medications like lactulose, um, rifaximin, which is a brand new drug that helps ammonia, um, high levels of ammonia because of the failure of her liver, because of the liver abnormality. So it's just, it's a lot. <laughs> what does the future hold for your daughter? At this point, she's actually gone through one liver transplant evaluation and been denied. She's also gone through two combined heart liver transplant evaluations and been denied. Um, and um, so at this point, um, we are at the end of our surgical journey, if you will. Um, and we are doing our best to give her the best quality of life um, and the best way to keep her out of full heart and liver failure for as long as possible. Um, well, she's going to have to have surgeries throughout her life, so hopefully the repairs will hold. There's there's no guarantee, but so far they're doing great. Um, the pacemaker is the big one, and more often than not with the pacemaker, it will be open heart. Um, well, they'll have to go in and um, you know crack the sternum and um, replace the leads that are connected to the heart. She. Um, Thankfully, doesn't have a complete heart block. She's got a second degree block, which means that she's not completely pacemaker dependent. So, if um, you know, if the pacemaker were to fail, she'd still be okay. Or if the battery ran out or something, um, it would just be, you know, it would it would take its toll on her. She would be working twice as hard for the same result. Basically, her best prognosis is is to maintain and to to keep on doing what she's been doing.